Welcome back, everyone. Well, doing something a little different today. Uh, and I had all these great plans for how I was going to do this video. And then JD went and blew them all up. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, many of you have heard me talk many times about my admiration and love for the channel, The History Underground, uh, and our friend JD, who runs that channel. And uh, he was at, as of an hour ago, 299,000 plus subscribers. And I, I know having just hit 300,000 just a few weeks ago myself, uh, what an exciting moment that is. And so I thought that I would do a video to help give him that little extra push over the edge. And then 10 minutes ago, right before I started recording this, I saw his post on Instagram that he hit 300,000. So thanks, JD, for stealing all my thunder. That's really your thunder anyway. But we're going to go ahead with the plans for this video because I've got a few things I want to talk about anyway. So normally I would not do a reaction to one of JD's videos because honestly his videos do not need reactions. They're standalone things and honestly there's not a lot I could offer uh, on top of the fantastic work that he's already done. But I thought this would be an opportunity uh, to shine a spotlight on his channel because he deserves that. Uh, and give you a little background about the history between the two of us. Um, so first of all, yeah... Now that I've got these 312,000 subscribers here on this channel, which I never in a million years thought would happen, uh, I've learned that one of the benefits to having that many subscribers is that I have opportunities to shine spotlights on other channels. Now, granted, he doesn't need the spotlight because he's got almost as many subs as me, and he can do that completely on his own. But if I can throw a few more people his way who might not have otherwise discovered his channel, then I'm glad to do that. So, first of all, a um, little background to those of you who are new to my channel. Um, this channel uh, I created two years ago. Actually, I think yesterday was the two-year anniversary from the time I created this channel. Um, created this channel with the goal of making vlogs from historical sites, which is exactly what JD does on the History Underground. That was what I planned to do. And I was looking... At, when I created this channel, I was looking for other people who were doing that just to see how they were doing it, to see what I could learn from them. And, and I very quickly discovered the History Underground. Uh, his channel at the time, I think when I first discovered it, he was somewhere around 60 or 70,000 subscribers. Uh, and I instantly fell in love with his channel, love what he does. I think he is the best at this. When it comes to historic site content, doing it all right, the, the perfect balance of entertainment, uh, information, and style, he's got it all. So he is, if, if you ask me to pick one channel, it would be his. Okay, so uh, so I had been following him for a while uh, when I first started this channel. Um, I think I discovered him. Uh, I was probably at around 10,000 subscribers when I discovered him. Fast forward to May of last year. I got an opportunity to join him and a team he had put together to do cleanup at Curahi, the mountain outside of Tacoa, Georgia, where the men of Easy Company uh, from World War II trained. If you've seen Band of Brothers, you're very familiar with what Curahi is. So there's a lot of graffiti up there. So I got to be a part of that team. So that was when I met JD for the first time. And while I was there in, uh, in uh, to Camp Tacoa, is when I passed him in subscribers. So it was kind of a, a fun moment. We were both at right around 110, 115,000 subscribers at the time. And ever since then, for the last 14 months, JD and I have been almost identical in subscribers. We've been within a few thousand of each other, and I imagine that'll probably continue. Uh, that I wouldn't mind a bit if he takes off and blows way past me and, and hits a million in the next couple of months. That would be fantastic. Uh, so there's always been this kind of mutual admiration society we have stayed connected ever since then. Uh, and I just want to say uh, up front that, um, listen, you guys don't necessarily get to see, uh, neither do I for the most part, what people are like when they're not on screen, right? You always wonder, are they like that in real life? Or is this just kind of the persona that they have for the camera? I can tell you 100% what you see is what you get with JD. He's a fantastic human being. I'll just give you a perfect example of the kind of person he is. Uh, many of you know that I went to the Netherlands and Belgium and Germany a couple of months ago. Uh, I've got three videos up now from that trip and more coming. Uh, well, JD reached out to me the day before I left for that trip 
and he called me. He, he called me through video chat on Facebook. And um, it wasn't something I asked him to do. It was something he reached out to me because he knew that I was going to be going to Foix, um, the Bois Jacques outside of uh, Bastogne. And so he reached out to me and said, hey, I know you're going there. I've been there myself. I want to show you some things on the map so you know exactly where you're going and what's going on. And he took a good half hour or so just to kind of talk me through when he was there and what he knows about where things happened and different things. And a lot of what you see in my video from the Bois Jacques is only possible because JD took the time to show me where things were. That's just the kind of person he is. Many of you, if you follow his channel, you know that he was in uh, he was in Poland uh, right after the war in Ukraine broke out. His son, actually, I think all three of his kids are were born in Ukraine, but he and his son went over to Poland to help with the refugee crisis. That's who JD is. Um, so I had that opportunity last year to join him. Uh, and Tacoa, and in a couple of weeks, you may have already heard me mention that JD and I are going to be getting together again, along with Gary from American Battlefield Trust and maybe some others, uh, to bring you some content from the Antietam Battlefield. I'm excited about that. And tonight, at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, JD and I are going to be joining Sarah, uh, the history chick. 1941, I think is her username, on Instagram for an Instagram Live. We're going to be doing a, a joint interview. So check that out if you're on Instagram. Um, just look for History Chick 1941. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what her username is. I've been following her for so long I should know this by now. Yeah, The History Chick 1941. Check her out. We'll be on there at 8 p.m. Eastern tonight. So with that in mind, I've got a lot of favorites among his videos. He's been to Normandy. He's got a series right now from the Pacific where he went to Saipan uh, and uh, Pearl Harbor and some other places. Uh, he's been to uh, battlefields here in the United States. He had a great series from Gettysburg, uh, which I think was fantastic. And uh, so this, though, has to be one of my favorites. And he's got a ton of videos from Normandy. Uh, it is on the ground at Braycore Manor. And this was one from, I think, several months ago. Uh, and it's one of my favorites that he's done. So I thought it'd be fun to just watch it together with you guys. Like I said, not a lot I can offer as far as reaction goes, but I might offer some commentary here and there. Uh, but join me as we do. I'll put a link in the description to uh, JD's video, the original video. Definitely check out his content. content. It's the best out there. I am not exaggerating when I say that. Here we go. JD loves his slow-mo shots, and I've actually uh, I started doing slow-mo shots with my videos in uh, For the, the past UK. few days, we have been making our way through the Normandy area. And uh, as you, you travel through this country, you'll see several little villages dotted throughout that, that look a lot like this one right here. This is the village of the Grand Chemin. And on the morning of D-Day, this would have served as the headquarters for the 2nd Battalion of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. In the early to mid-morning hours, the, the guys here started to hear the firing of guns just to the south of us. So Colonel Strayer uh, tasked Easy Company with going out and silencing the guns at a place that is now legendary in 101st Airborne history at Braycourt Manor. So yeah, if you see the scene in Band of Brothers where they call Winters in, like they're sending somebody out there like, um, Colonel Strayer wants, it might have been Major Strayer, I don't remember if he was a colonel by this point or not, uh, wants Easy Company CO up front, and, and that's when Winters goes in and they're in that farmhouse. That's there at the Le Grand Chemin. And um, fun thing, I get to meet the actor who played Colonel Strayer. Uh, he's going to be on our tour that we're going to be doing uh, at, in Bastogne. I'm going back to Bastogne in November, so excited to meet him. He's a, he's a British actor like a lot of the guys in Band of Brothers were. He was also in The Lost Battalion, another uh, fantastic war movie. Isn't his editing just fantastic? He, he's so much better than I will ever be at this. Some drone shots. He, when we when we were in 
Tacoa, JD had his drone out and I had my drone out at the same time. Now my drone is a DJI Mini 2, so it's like, I don't know, six or seven inches wide and JD's got one of those big drones and like I was just afraid his drone was gonna eat my drone. Uh, it's really nice. So as I mentioned, this is the village of Le Grand Chemin. And whenever a lot of people visit Braycourt Manor, they, they forget that uh, the guys from Easy Company actually started right here. Now, as I mentioned, Colonel Strayer uh, had tasked the Easy Company with going and silencing these guns that had opened up uh, on causeway number two. And with the leadership of Dick Winters, they advanced up the hedgerows in that direction right there. And this is something actually that I learned from JD when I saw this video. I loved his use of maps to help you kind of orient yourself to what's happening and where. Because that's one of the things that it can get really confusing when you're watching videos to understand exactly what's happening and where. And that was one of the... the toughest things for me about the Band of Brothers portrayal of uh, the Breakcore Manor assault is that it's hard to get a sense of what's happening and, and what the layout is. And I think JD really helps explain that in this. And so I've started trying to incorporate more uses of maps. I steal a lot of ideas from JD because I think that highly of how he does things. Now, after Dick Winters made his way up and did a reconnaissance of the area and assess the situation, he ended up dividing his men up into two teams. One was going to be led by him, and one was going to be led by Buck Compton. And they were going to make what is now uh, a legendary assault on the four guns that were firing on Causeway Number 2 and on Utah Beach there at Braycourt Manor. So anyway, we're going to head on up here uh, to the manor and uh, get, get an up-close look of what happened there on June 6th. Uh, I do need to add one quick thing though. Uh, like all things when it comes to history, we have to approach the story of Bray Court with a measure of humility. Uh, there will be sites on the internet who will claim to know the exact details of what happened here, but the truth is, uh, there are just some of the details that we don't know. Uh, the, the veterans of Easy Company themselves disagreed on yep. some of the finer details. Uh, there were some of the men who participated Buck. in this action who didn't want to comment on it because they legitimately had That's no recollection of the events. Uh, keep yeah, he makes an excellent point there. Uh, eyewitness accounts of things are notoriously um, filled with discrepancies, even amongst each other. Buck Compton remembered the Breakcourt Manor assault very differently than Dick Winters did. Uh, and so when you're trying to put together a story, all you can do is put that stuff out there and say, here, listen, this is what he said. This is what he said. This is what we think probably happened. This is what the evidence points to. But we will never know 100% for sure. It was confused. It was kind of all happening at once. These guys had been up all night because they had landed, you know, uh, early in the morning and so they're tired they're running on adrenaline um you know, there's just a lot like he said that we just don't know for sure keep in mind this was the the first day in a long war for these guys so anyway uh just keep that in mind as we move forward great point All right, well, uh, right now, before we go on to Braycourt Manor itself, I wanted to stop here at the monument. Now, on a, a previous trip to Normandy, uh, we had a video where we stopped here in this very location, talked a little bit about the action here at Braycourt. Uh, today, we're actually going to go on to the property. Now, I do need to mention something before we go in. This is actually private property. You can visit the memorial and you can see the, the whole thing here. Uh, but this is a working farm. As a matter of fact, it's still owned by the family that owned it in 1944, and it's, it's not public property, so there's no pu public access. Uh, they could probably make a lot of money charging people admission to that. Uh, I don't know how that would go, but anyway. Um, so one of the, the cool things about um, Band of Brothers making Easy Company as popular as it did is that now everywhere you go associated with Easy Company, they've got these memorials. Now, 
on one hand, it's cool. On the other hand, it's like, you know, those guys have been given a prominence that hasn't been afforded to thousands of other companies who did great things and, and suffered greatly as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's true. There are these places where they show these um, monuments that have the list of the men who died there. There's one at Foi. There's uh, several of them in the Netherlands as well. The owner, a guy by the name of Charles de Bavier, is good friends with Eric Dorf. <laughs> Slight pronunciation of last name. JD, I love you, brother. And you know how highly I think of you, but your French pronunciation's not very good. <laughs> My favorite is when he goes to the Bois Jacques, which means Jack's Woods in French. Uh, and he calls it the Beau Jacques. Um, and there's another one where he's in Normandy and he was staying at a... Uh, like a bed and breakfast or something, and he butchered that name too. Listen, I took three years of French in high school and a year in college, so my, my French is a little bit better than his, but of all the things I could criticize him for, that's about the worst, so awesome job. Uh, from the Gettysburg Museum of History, and he has graciously allowed us to um, access the property and uh, show us a few things himself. It's actually no wind. That never happens for me in Europe. Andrew is calling here in this place. If you, you must go if you want. You have the time? Yeah. Yes. We have all kinds of time. <laughs> <laughs> Take all the time you need, man. And this is another thing that JD's really good at that I'm not, is networking. He's great at connecting with people like Eric Dorr from the... Uh, Gettysburg Museum of History, which gets him access to all these really cool places. Um, I, I've just never been very good at that. That's just kind of how I am. All right, so right now I'm making my way up from uh, Le Grand Chemin, where we started out. And this right here is kind of the, the trench line or the ditch that the men from Easy Company would have used to advance on the guns, which were positioned behind this hedgerow over here. Now, there was a guy from headquarters company who got hit right here in this area, uh, was shot right between the eyes whenever he- That's the guy you see in Band of Brothers, and it did l literally happen exactly that way, where he's crawling out and he's talking to, um, to uh, Sergeant uh, Lipton, and he's, he's asking where headquarters is, and he pops his head up and the bullet hits him. That's That did happen. And like Lipton was just shocked. He couldn't figure out why in the world there was a guy out in the middle of the battlefield crawling around trying to find headquarters. He lifted his head up uh, above the, the ditch line. Uh, we're gonna talk about that in one of the American uh, artifact videos. But for right now, I'm gonna see if I can jump down in this ditch. All right, so I uh, just crossed the fence and uh, fortunately it was not electrified <laughs> and we're making our way down into this ditch and wow. So ahead of me is Le Grand Chemin where we started off and this is the hedgerow that Compton and Garnier and Malarkey would have advanced along. And uh, there, there's a spot up ahead of me where this ditch line forms a, a bit of a dog leg, and that's where Petty and Liebgott would have set up their machine gun. Yeah, so Cleveland Petty and uh, Joe Liebgott were there. They had um, that machine gun. One of the things that you can see right away with how the layout is of Normandy, and, and this was one of the things that really slowed down the Allied advance, but it also benefited Easy Company in this situation, is that you could be just feet away from somebody and they might not see you at all because you've got these very natural um, places that just kind of hide you, but they also slow you down in terms of advancing, especially with armor and things like that. 
And uh, Winters, along with Joe Toy and Popeye Wynn and a guy named Gerald Lorraine, would have gone up another hedgerow across the field to my left right now. And uh, Charles was telling me that because of erosion, uh, the, the ditch as we see it now is actually deeper than it would have been in 1944. But this right here is the route that the guys from Easy would have taken. And as they advanced, well, they would have hit a 90 degree turn. And right up through here is where they would have advanced on gun number one. And as you can see, isn't this just really cool? I mean, this is just a perspective on an event many of us are familiar with that you never otherwise would get. And I will say this, there's nothing like being there yourself. Um, from all the places I've been, I can say that, and especially having just come back from the highlands of Scotland, pictures and video just do not do justice to being in a place for yourself. But I understand that many of us, most of us will never get to a lot of these places. You know, most of us are never gonna be able to walk onto Breakhorn Manor like this. And so in absence of being able to do it ourselves, this is the next best thing. And I always, always, always say, that when I visit a place in person, my perspective on what happened there almost always changes because it's one thing to read about it. It's one thing to see it on TV. It's one thing to, to learn about it through a documentary. It's a very different thing to stand there and see where it happened. You can see uh, it's a little bit dense here. So uh, we're gonna have to hop back out into the field. Okay, uh, just got out of the trench. Now, the men from Easy Company would have advanced right along this spot right here. And just on the other side of this cow would have been the number one gun for brake court battery. All right, now this is where things get a little bit foggy. Mm. Uh, this is the approximate location of the first 105 millimeter gun. Uh, now, some of the veterans said that it was here, others said that it was on the other side of this brush line to my right, and it's also approximately somewhere in here where uh, Popeye Wynn got hit in the butt as the assault on the number one gun was taking place. And uh, Charles was telling me that in his latter years, Carwood Lipton came back out to visit this place and said after they took out that first 105, he advanced along this brush line right here and went up a tree right here That's in the tree. this corner. And this has sometimes been referred to as Lipton's tree. And he said that he did it so that he could get a, a better viewpoint and cover the guys who were continuing on down the trench. So yeah, you see that in Band of Brothers, him climbing up that tree and, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the guys in uh, Easy Company said that they did things on D-Day, took chances on D-Day that they would never have done later on in the war uh, you know but it's your first time you're not really thinking about it you haven't seen guys get hit yet um, so you know you're kind of feeling a little invincible but then once guys start getting hit and your friends who you've known at this point you've trained with for two years start dying you suddenly realize you need to start being a little more cautious and there was another guy from easy by the name of Mike Rainey who would have been down here at the bottom of the tree so those two guys Played by Stephen Graham, who's become a pretty big movie star these days. Going to be covering the advance on down this trench line to the numbers two and three guns. Uh, now, it's also been said that Lipton's tree was in the hedge row behind me where we, we popped out in the field. Uh, so it's possible that Lipton's memory might have been slightly off as far as the exact location of the tree. Uh, because honestly, this does seem like a pretty exposed spot right here. Uh, but really what is most important is what he and Rainey did that day to cover the guys from Easy as they were advancing on guns two and three. This is uh, the sketch that Dick, Dick Winters made in his D-Day diary when he sat down at Carantan and uh, wrote about what had happened here. And um, it shows La Grande Chemin, which is up that way, shows how they came down the hedgerows. Now he, he divided the men into two groups. 
The first one led by Lieutenant Buck Compton, the second one by Winters. And they came up the trenches we were just in, and then they came up to this hedgerow, and it shows the guns, the way they were positioned. Now, you know, actually, you know, in, in, in reality, they were a little closer to that um, hedgerow. It's a little off scale, but he's showing one gun kind of pointing the opposite direction and the four guns pointing this way towards Utah Beach. So yeah, so Eric Dorr's got a lot of Winters memorabilia because you gotta remember, he's from the Gettysburg Museum of History. Winters is from uh, what is it, Lancaster County, which is right outside of Gettysburg. Uh, he's from Ephrata, I think, in Lancaster County. I've been to his grave there. Um, and uh, so, you know, Gettysburg's super, super close to where Winters is from. So it was very natural that a lot of Winters stuff would end up in Eric's hands and they were really covering causeway number two. There were only, there were only four ways into the mainland from Utah Beach because the Germans had flooded the fields. So everything was underwater except for four causeways and those are the four ways tanks could get up here. So the Germans smartly had trained their guns on those four causeways and the Braycourt battery so that's something that goes all the way back to World War One, right? You know, you funnel them into kill, killing zones. Uh, and so flooding the fields, they did a lot of other things. A lot of this was the idea of Erwin um, uh, Rommel, who had uh, been in charge of setting up the defenses in the area. Um, flooding the fields, uh, putting posts to prevent the gliders from being able to land, uh, a lot of things to prevent paratroopers and tanks and all those sorts of things. And, and so, yeah, funneling everybody onto certain roadways makes it a lot easier to kill them. Was focused on causeway number two, which goes to Utah Beach. Now, this gun seems to be pointing a little bit different. Now, we're not sure if that was just a mistake. You know, he's jotting this down from memory. He's seeing things in a different perspective. You know, when you're in combat, you're seeing just mm -hmm. what's in front of you. Um, and it also shows the MG42s that were back here that were covering the rear. So this is Dick Winter's map and um, other historians have gone off this. I mean, this is a pretty, pretty vivid map done really soon after it happened. But I want to also say that Dick Winters came back here many years later with uh, Carwood Lipton, Stephen Ambrose, and a few other men and they drew a more detailed map and in that one the, all the guns are pointing the same way. So we believe they were probably pointed towards Causeway number two and Utah Beach and they were certainly the shells firing from these guns landed towards Utah Beach because there's reports saying that after these guns were silenced no more artillery fell on Utah Beach. Big deal. All right, so Charles actually has an aerial reconnaissance photo that was taken in 1944. So uh, right up in here and is... It really doesn't look all that different, does it? I mean, the hedgerows, it looks so similar to what it did in 1944. That's awesome. Where the monument is currently located. Uh, this is Le Grand Chemin. This is the ditch that we came up. Uh, right here is that corner where we popped out in. And right here is the approximate location of gun number two. Staying in cover the whole time. All right, so we don't know with 100% certainty uh, the exact spot where the number two gun was, but it was right here in this area. And we also have a Braycourt cow hanging out with us today. <laughs> I, I love the mix of the present day with the history. And this is so true with so many places in history. Imagine the people who live on these incredibly famous battlefields and they have no clue what happened there. Uh, I was thinking about that when I was in, um, I was at the Chickamauga battlefield uh, because you come in from one side of the battlefield and there's this housing development right there. Same thing's true in Atlanta. Most of the battle of Atlanta took place on what is now housing uh, developments. There's no trace of the battlefield left and there's these incredibly consequential events that took place in a place like this and now there's just a farmer with his field and a cow and there's really just no trace of this incredibly historic moment that took place. It's, it's really kind of cool. 
All right, so we are walking down the trench line from the number two gun position. Uh, something else that is worth noting, so, so the trenches and the guns are right here, kind of in this direction. Back here, all along this tree line, would have been several uh, German machine gun positions that were basically designed to protect the guns. So you can imagine how crazy it was whenever Tom Malarkey ran out into this field to try and capture what he thought was a Luger. Again, talking about that idea of people taking chances they never would have taken after that day. And Malarkey running out there into an open field in front of machine gun fire is a perfect example of that. Okay, so this area right here is approximately where the number three gun was located. And this would have been the last one that Easy Company took before Ron Spears and some of the guys from Dog Company came in and took over and moved into the fourth gun. Now, there's a pretty interesting story out there and I'm hesitant to share it because the accounts are a little bit hazy. So, so don't take this for gospel. But Easy Company was not the first ones to encounter uh, the guns here at Braycourt. That makes sense. That was actually Dog Company. Uh, they had come through and, and whether they tried to move in on the guns or whether it was a patrol, we, we don't really know. But what we do know is that there was machine gun fire from this position and Dog Company sustained a lot of casualties. Uh, one paratrooper uh, saw the lieutenant with his, his hands uh, covering his face and, and crying back at uh, like the headquarters area and it's hypothesized that the guys from dog company whenever Spear says hey can we take this last gun uh, that what they were doing was was revenge. trying to um, I guess kind of get revenge yeah. or, or kind of even the score for the guys that they had lost earlier in the day makes sense and if that's true, it makes what Winters and the guys from Easy Company did all the more remarkable because that means that uh, these Germans were already aware that there were Americans in the area and were probably that much more heightened in terms of keeping their eyes peeled for any potential attack. All right, and this is the approximate area where the number four gun would have been. And that wrapped up the assault on Braycourt Battery, which of course was made famous by the series Band of Brothers. Dick Winters was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his role in the attack on this battery. So you can see Winters, that's him right there. Um, and he's a captain by that point. He's been promoted by the time. There's uh, Omar Bradley up here. You can see him with the three stars right there. I don't know who else is there, but um, so they, there was a stupid rule that there could be only one Medal of Honor awarded for Normandy per division, which meant that only one person in the 101st could get the Medal of Honor. And that rightfully went to Bob Cole, who was a lieutenant colonel who led a bayonet charge. I uh, was later killed in Operation Market Garden. I had the chance to visit his grave uh, at the cemetery there. Um, so that meant that even though Winters was actually nominated by Colonel Sink for the Medal of Honor, uh, but because of that arbitrary rule, his was downgraded to the next highest award, which was the Distinguished Service Cross. And the leadership that he exhibited on D-Day. But man, to be able to walk this place, mm -hmm and kind of following the footsteps of, of these men is something else. I'm so thankful to Charles. Yeah, and this is one of the other reasons I think I love JD's stuff so much is that he reacts to being at these places exactly the same way I do. Uh, he, you know, he's, he's not just there. Listen, when I go to these historic sites, um, I unfortunately get in business mode, right? I'm thinking about making the video and squeezing in as much content as I can. And so like when I went to the World War I battlefields, I was doing like five, six, seven videos a day, which meant as soon as I was done recording, I was boom, off to the next site. I didn't really take the time to 
just appreciate where I was. And so when I went back to Europe in April and May, um, I planned far fewer videos. I only did like two or three videos a day because I wanted to really just take the time to, to soak it in and to appreciate where I was. And JD responds exactly the same way I do. I felt exactly the same way being in these places. That he allowed us to, to come out and do this so that we could share it with others. But uh, yeah, kind of at a loss for words, but that was Braycourt Battery. Awesome stuff. So I hope if you have not already that you will definitely check out JD's channel. JD, congratulations on 300,000 subscribers. May you hit a million as quickly as possible. You deserve it, my friend. Uh, I'll see you tonight uh, in our interview with Sarah, the history chick, and then I will see you in a couple of weeks at Antietam. All right, thanks guys for watching.